Hi, this is uh, Mike Edelhart, and I'm here with uh, another uh, edition of Inception, our podcast about beginnings, the beginnings of companies, new ideas, uh, new science, and sometimes even a little glimpse of the future. And uh, with me here today to maybe talk about a little bit of all of that in a way that uh, uh, we don't always get is Matt Engel of Paradromics. Uh, uh, great to have you here. Thanks for uh, joining us. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. So let's just so that everybody knows, why don't we make sure everybody understands what Paradromics does? Because you, we have great companies, but you are easily one of the most interesting companies we have um, because this is pretty dramatic sci-fi-esque stuff. So why don't you explain what Aerodromics is doing now and what you're aiming to do. Yeah, so we build brain implants. We build chips that go uh, into the brain and then act as modems for the brain. So they read out neural data and then they can even transmit neural data uh, to the brain. So they act almost as a translator between brains and computers. We didn't invent the idea of a brain computer interface, but what we're doing is we're building a, uh, a better com brain computer interface than you can find in academia right now. We're productizing it and we're turning it into a medical device so that we can reframe a lot of classically challenging uh, diseases and injuries as data problems. So for instance, you wouldn't normally think about paralysis as a data problem, but in some ways paralysis is the inability to get data uh, out of your brain to affect the world around you. And for someone who's, you know, completely trapped in their body because of high spinal cord injury or something like ALS, um, just being able to give them a link back to the world by tapping into brain data allows them to, uh, to type on a computer or even speak. And these are the kinds of things you can do when you have a modem for the brain. It's a pretty remarkable idea. So again, just to make sure everybody um, who may not be uh, 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 brain geeks or computer geeks. So back in the day, a modem was the idea that telephone line, which is how before the internet, we used to actually send things around is an analog signal that goes up and down. Mm -hmm. And the computer is a digital signal that uh, essentially is reading highs and lows. And if you want to take something from a computer and send it over the phone, you got to translate it and vice versa. And that's what a modem did back in the day. It took a digital signal and made it into a waveform it took a waveform and resampled it and turned it into a digital signal so that you could send computer stuff over the phone. And you're essentially talking about the same thing here, right? The computer is still digital and the brain is still basically analog. Yeah. And so in some ways, the digital to analog thing is really true. We're translating signals from different domains. But then, you know, the other thing that modems and, and, and networking did more generally is there was what you could do with the computer, you know, as a discrete unit disconnected from the world. And then there's what you could do once you could connect computers to other computers. And in the same way, the ability to connect the brain, there's what a brain can do in isolation. And then there's what you could do with a brain if you could connect it to a computer and you could think, and you can start to reframe the brain as a data system. And suddenly you can leverage the entire 21st century, you know, computer and internet infrastructure uh, to, to work with the brain. So let's just take that as an example. So you've got your, and is it, just so folks understand, it literally is a chip, is it like an overlay that sits on the brain? Is it potentially at some point an overlay that sits outside the skull and talks to the brain or? It's a, it's a chip and ours is about eight millimeters by eight millimeters. And then um, coming off of one face of the chip is an array of little hair-like fibers called microwires. Each of them are about four times smaller than a human hair, and they're 1.5 millimeters long. And this, this chip, it literally sits on the surface of the brain, and it's anchored into the brain by these hair-like fibers that penetrate down into the brain. And then these fibers can record electrical signals. The chip interprets them, and it's transmitted out of the body. So a computer's picking up this pattern of activity from the brain. And then what can the computer do with it? Compare it to a corpus, an AI-like corpus of all the patterns of activity of all the brains and stuff like that. 
So it, yeah, it's more bespoke than that. So it's not like we have this universal sort of dictionary of what the brain does and, and then we kind of reference it. But rather what we do is we learn the patterns of every individual brain and we kind of abstract, you know, maybe you have thousands and thousands of neurons that are firing these things called action potentials, these little binary signaling events. If you want a mental model for what the brain looks like, you could imagine like uh, a neuron firing action potentials, as they're called, these binary signaling events, has roughly the same data rate as like a Morse code telegraph operator, like an old timey telegraph operator. So you can imagine these like thousands and thousands right. of telegraph operators that are connected. Each one is connected to probably 10,000 other telegraph operators. They're sending out these kind of sparse codes and you're just, you're just listening to it. Um, and then what, you know, machine learning models will do is they build a much more simplified, what's called lower dimensional representation of all that activity. Um, so even though there may be thousands and thousands and thousands of neurons, the activity of that whole system may only be, uh, may be much lower dimensional. So it right. may be encoding only a few salient things that you can, that you can read out. And so the work of neural decoders is to try to find those underlying dimensions, those underlying features in the activity, and then map them onto something that we're interested in, like a right. computer. So, uh, so maybe you got a double fire somewhere, or you've got a particular pattern that might be an indication of an issue, a problem, mm -hmm. syndrome of some kind, and you're reading all this and the computer can recognize it. Um, a, is that a, at least reasonably accurate representation? And then I suspect the thing folks are wondering listening to this, so can the computer turn around and cause that to go away? Can the computer turn around and cause the imprint of a new pattern so that, oh, your hand stopped shaking, uh, that kind of uh, yeah. thing? Yeah, and I mean, if we think there's some, you know, more crude versions of what you just described that exist on the market right now. So for instance, there's a company called Neuropace. Um, they have a, a device that's on the market right now. There are people with this system. It has electrodes that are listening for epileptic activity, kind of listening for like the, the tremors that occur before uh, an on the onset of epilepsy. And they also have stimulating electrodes that can try to interrupt that uh, epilepsy. And so that's, um, that's a pretty low data rate application that has a really interesting therapeutic uh, outcome. Got it. And does it extend to learning? So you can maybe take things up a little bit or down a little bit. You can modulate mood, if you want to call it that, or psychological state by kind of normalizing or recalibrating the signal. But is this the kind of thing where at some point there's the brain computer language and it's, you know, routine, get French. If you think about it, I mean, everything that we do is neural activity. There's the, ma the material basis for consciousness and, and everything that we do are neurons firing. And so at some level, the answer is always yes. If you, now the question is, what, how sophisticated of a BCI do you need for what application? I think that the products that Paradromics is building for people who are severely paralyzed, those won't be the same products that, you know, I want to learn Kung Fu. So I kind of go right. on and download it online, but the, the underlying kind of processes, uh, you know, the way that you're reading out the data, the way that you're stimulating neurons to fire. I mean, that's, that's fundamentally what, what you would be doing to do something like learn French. Um, things like memory are more are obviously more complicated because there's not, it's not just about spiking neurons. It's also about the underlying molecular circuitry that encodes those memories. So there's still, it's obviously there's a lot more complexity uh, underlying the matrix versus these early examples. But I think um, I think once you open your mind to the idea that everything that we do has neural activity at its roots and that we can read and write neural activity with increasingly higher sophistication, then you can let your imagination run wild.
Yeah, you really can. And and you brought up consciousness. I was thinking when we started this, I wonder if we're going to go there. I mean, you know, there is a growing school of thought that consciousness is an, a pure artifact of the brain. That um, And if one accepts that consciousness is a pure artifact of the brain, that means we get enough brain information from enough people uh, in enough circumstances with enough depth it should be describable, shouldn't it? It's a deep question. <laughs> I, think, I think a lot of neuroscientists that I know have, on one hand, they have the way they study the brain, the way they think about the brain intellectually, and then they have also the way that they live their life on a daily basis. So I think most scientists I know probably regard consciousness as something like the... Uh, on the fly reconciliation of a lot of disparate sensory streams um, and, and, and sort of, and back checking against the kind of log of, of memories. It's kind of a, you have so much data coming in and you're constantly trying to kind of trying to find things that are salient and, and recognize um, kind of deeper picture of, of, of what's going on. And it's that um, it's that constant kind of reconstruction and I think you have, you have certain interesting um, phenomena that occur, kind of artifacts, if you will, that kind of that back that view. Like um, uh, the example of uh, the sort of incubus succubus phenomenon. I don't know. Have you ever heard of it? The, the, the kind of um, mm -hmm. medieval kind of ghost-like characters that bother people. Mm -hmm. right. But anyone who's ever had. Um, Sleep paralysis. Have you ever have you ever had sleep paralysis? Are you are you familiar with that? I've heard the term, but no, I haven't. It's really especially when you heard. kind of come out of your uh, REM sleep at the wrong right. time. So your body is paralyzed, but your eyes might be open, and you're starting to take in sensory information. And um, it's really common that the way that people piece that together, their kind of consciousness kind of pieces that together, is that they imagine that they must be held down. They must be being held down by some right. sort of um, antagonistic Same. force, right. and so they and they and they visualize it as some sort of like horrible demon right. or whatever their like worst projection of a person who would be holding right. them down and suffocating them might be. And they right. they they kind of recreate this for a period of seconds where they're partially awake and partially not awake. And it's interesting. I read an account of um, you know sleep paralysis in a small child, and and small children don't necessarily know to be afraid of such things. So there was a a child that, who recounted sleep paralysis is thinking that there were penguins having a picnic on her, on her, on her chest. <laughs> mm. <laughs> she, didn't, she didn't perceive anything terrifying about it. She just woke up and couldn't move. Yeah, yeah. Reconstructed yeah. this kind of childlike scene. Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, when I think of consciousness, I, I, as a scientist, I kind of think of these things. And when I think about it as a person, I don't like to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> so let's take it back over to the practical. So you have this brain uh, modem. Uh, so what are you doing right now with it? You've talked about a couple of these, but are you going after specific uh, syndromes in a specific way? And, and if so, where are you in that uh, process? So our first application, our first application is building a, uh, building a read interface, so interprets the signals, pulls them out for people who are so severely paralyzed that they cannot uh, speak and they can't easily type. Um, so people who's, you know, maybe like Stephen Hawking would be a popular, right. popularly known example. Um, it's a really difficult situation to be in because you can't even communicate your needs very quickly. Um, you can't have, you can't be conversant. Right. Um, we, we see this as the first thing that BCI should do because one, the, the, the unmet medical need is extremely high. And two, we already know that you can do it because there are some really, really compelling examples uh, of scientific studies using uh, the Utah array, which is a microelectric array produced by BlackRock Microsystems, um, where people have had these devices in their brain and are able to communicate at 10 to 18 words per minute just by thinking, just by controlling a computer with their thoughts. And so, you know, we see that 
there's this really compelling existence proof that it will work. There's this population of people who desperately need something. Um, and in our mind, the, they're really just structural barriers for why a, pro a product doesn't exist here already. I mean, there's some technical things that need to be updated, but it represents more, uh, it's more of a case of someone just needs, needed to come and do it and do everything right and, and put, offer a product. Got it. So when might we see that product? I think the first people will see that product in 2023 in a small feasibility study. Um, and then it'll be some, some few years before it's available commercially. And uh, how'd you come to be doing this? I mean, uh, of all the things you might be doing as a scientist, yeah. for this particular career choice, uh, quest, whatever you want to call it, come about? Yeah, so I, I became fascinated in neuroscience when I was in college. And um, I pretty quickly came to the conclusion that, I mean, I was, it wasn't what excited me most or what I was best at to do, you know, basic discovery. So I always, I, I found myself gravitating more toward, toward tool making and, and kind of problem solving than basic discovery. Got it. Well, we could go on for hours. I love what you guys are doing. I get excited every time I hear about it. But uh, we can only go on for so long. So imagine that uh, the folks listening to us are largely uh, other entrepreneurs, some scientists, some not. Uh, if there were one bit of learned wisdom you have for them based on your experience running this company so far, uh, what might it be? <laughs> well, <laughs> um, I was talking to someone else who's starting out in a kind of deep tech hardware space, another uh, young CEO, um, just a couple of days ago, and my advice was, take the money. <laughs> I think, uh, especially if you're really, um, I think especially if you're, if you're really a mission-driven founder, and there's something bigger that you're trying to build, I've never heard of an. I've never heard an example of someone who comes back and who's really successful and was like, "If I could have redone this whole thing again, I could be ten percent richer if I had taken you know, like less capital in this one round." Yeah. But I, I mean, obviously, it's you always hear about people who, who there was who left left too much money on the table or weren't aggressive enough in the beginning, and for people who are trying to build, um, really ambitious technologies or, um. Yeah, sort of deep tech or kind of hardware startups. I think I've just never heard of a single person say that they they raise too much capital. It's as good a note as any to end on. Uh, as a venture capitalist who offers money, I thank you. <laughs>